Welcome back. Chapter 36. Do you want to tell me what the hell is going on, Max? Sarah was driving. Max was in the passenger seat. Her eyes were on the road, but it felt like her gaze was boring through his skin. I'm not sure Burroughs did it. Did what? Killed the kid. You're a defense attorney now? No, Max said. I'm a law enforcement officer. Who is assigned to capture an escaped convict? Sarah said. If he didn't do it, there are courts and laws and an entire legal system that can remedy that. It's not your job. It's not my job. Our job is to bring him in. Our job is about justice. He broke out of prison. That's up for the debate. What? He had help. We both know that. You're talking about the warden? Yes, I spoke to him. Max filled her in. Sarah face reddened. My God, she said, we need to arrest McKenzie. Sarah, are you listening to yourself, Max? You're being played. The DNA test shows he's not the father. Big whoop. If anything, this hurt his case. How so? Max asks. The wife, the one we just visited, she's not telling us everything. You can see that, right? Right. It's pretty simple, Max. She had an affair. Oh, or a boyfriend. Heck, probably with her current husband. Maybe Matthew is his son, that Dreesen guy, and David Burroughs found that out. So Burroughs killed the little boy? Sure. Why not? You think he's the first cockle to kill an offspring? But either way, and I need you to listen to this, Max. We have a legal system to remedy these, these things. A perfect system, no? In your free time, you can go through all the prisons and find innocent people who have been incarcerated and help free them. Do it. I'll admire it. But don't break them out of prison, Max. Don't give them guns. Don't let them destroy whatever is left of our tattered, flawed system. We need to capture Burroughs. That's it. He's an armed and dangerous felon. We need to treat him like one. You got that? I want to know if he did it or not. Then I'm calling this in, Sarah said. What do you mean? I'm getting you removed from this case, Max. You don't belong on it. You do that to me? I love you, Sarah said. I also love our oath and our legal system. You're not seeing straight. Her phone buzzed. She answered it. Jablonski, Burroughs just broke into a home in Connecticut. He held the woman hostage at gunpoint. What else could I do? I couldn't shoot Irene. I couldn't tie her up. That all looks good on television, but the practicality of it made no sense. I guess if we had more time, we could have taken her phone and locked her in a closet. But she was trying to get us out of the house fast because her boys would be home. And so they find her. And again, did I want to leave this poor woman with any more mental scars? Not to mention what finding their mother look locked in a closet would do to two young boys. So we begged her not to call the police. We explained as best as we could that we were trying to rescue my son. She nodded. But as I've met now mentioned several times, she was only doing that to pacify me. She wasn't listening. And so we drove fast and hoped for the best. What else could we do? The police, would, the police would find us. It was only a question of time. We debated changing license plates with the car in a lot again or trying to get Hester Crimson to send us another vehicle or even just taking an Uber. We concluded that any of that would just slow us down. In the end, the drive from Irene House to the Payne Estate would be a little over two hours. The police had no idea where we were going. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was best Rachel and I decided to go for it. We were now at the end game. There was no reason to run anymore. Rachel has given me the will now and I'm driving over the speed limit, but not fast enough for us to get stopped. 
It is odd to be driving a car after five years. It isn't like I forgot or anything. The old line about never forget how to ride a bike applies to cars too, I guess. But the experience after spending the last five years in a cage is strangely invigorating. I am focused solely on finding my son, on rescuing him, on learning the truth about what happened on that horrible night. That was the only reason I wanted to escape. I didn't care about freedom for myself, but now that I'm out, now that I'm tasting what life used to be like, I can't help but want to be free. I am not saying it was something I took for granted. It just didn't matter with Matthew gone. I don't understand this, Rachel says to me. Why would Matthew be with Hayden Payne so the ring belonged to Hayden? They put two and two together. Okay. I have some theories, but I don't want to voice them yet. Should I call him? She asks. Hayden? Yes. And say what? She considers this. I don't know. We have to drive up there. And then what, David? They have gates. They have security. I'll hide in the back again. Seriously? We can't tip him off, Rachel. I get that, but I also can't just show up out of the blue. We don't even know if Hayden is home. In a sense, it doesn't matter. There is only one direction for us now. The Payne estate in Newport on Easton Bay. If Hayden Payne isn't there, we park somewhere nearby and hide and wait. He has my son. Maybe we should call the police, Rachel says, and tell them what? That Matthew is alive and we believe Hayden Payne has him. And what do you think the police would do with that information? Issue a warrant on one of the country's wealthiest family off? Off what? That photograph? She doesn't reply. And if that boy becomes a threat to the Payne dynasty, do you think they'll produce him? Or do you think they'll get rid of the evidence? I drive, spending too much time looking in my rearview mirror, convinced that any moment I'll see the flashing lights of a squad car. We are making good time. Look at my phone, I tell Rachel. What? I took a screenshot of an old email. Look at it. She does. When she puts the phone back down, she asks, do you want to talk about it? No time now. We need to focus on this first. Rachel and I come up with a plan of sorts as we hit Route 102 South. She picks up her mobile and calls Hayden. I can hear the phone ringing. My heart is in my throat. Rachel? His voice, Hayden's pain, I hear it and I know. He has my son. He took him from me. I think I even get why now, but none of that matters. It do too, because I want to know. <laughs> Rachel clears her throat. <clears throat> hey Hayden, are you all right? I'm fine. Did you get the photographs I sent you? I did, thank you. That's why I'm calling. Can I come see you? When? Like in 10 minutes. I'm at the Payne Estate. Yeah, I'm just driving into Newport. Can I come by? There is a long pause. Rachel looks over to me. I try to keep my breathing even. Another second passes. Rachel can't take it. I want to talk to you about a few of the photos. Do you think you see this mystery boy in any of them? He asks. No, I think you were right about that, Hayden. Oh, I don't think Matthew is in any of the pictures. I think my nephew died five years ago, but I think someone is trying to set David up. Set him up how? I need your help in identifying some of the people in the photos. Rachel. Thousands of our employees were at the event. I've been overseas. I don't really know, but you can still help, right? I just need to show you the people. I mean, and maybe you can ask around. I'm almost at your gate. Can you just help me with this? Is David with you? What? No. The police thinks you're, the police think you're involved in his escape. It's on the news. He's not with me, she says. Do you know where he is? And now Rachel sees her opening. Not on the phone, Hayden. I'll be there in five minutes. She hangs up. We find a quiet spot to pull over and move fast. I open the back hatch door and squeeze in. 
There is a black plastic top to hide whatever you might store in there. I fold myself down and drop it on top of myself. I'm hidden. We call each other so I can hear all. Rachel takes the wheel. I lay in darkness. Five minutes later, Rachel says, I'm pulling up to the guardhouse. I hear muffled conversation and then I hear Rachel say her name. I don't know what's going on, of course. I'm in a dark hatch. I try to stay perfectly still. Rachel says it's a fox cheery voice in a fox cheery voice. Thank you. And we start moving again. David, can you hear me? I take the phone off mute. I'm here. In about 15 seconds, I'm going to pull around the curb I told you about. You ready? Yes. We had discussed this. The road up to the estate is lined with emerald evergreens. There is something of a blind curve, Rachel told me, where I can hop out and duck behind the trees and perhaps, perhaps not be seen. Now, she says, the car stops. I ease out of the back, hit the ground, shut the back hatch. It takes me no more than three seconds. I keep low and roll behind an evergreen. She continues to drive. I move to the other side of the scrub. When I stand up, the view laid out before me is beyond awe-inspiring. The pain estate is built on a cliff. In the distance, over an expanse of green, I can see the waves of the Atlantic Ocean. The lawn has gardens that must be manicured by gods. There are scrubs shaped as animals, as people, as skyscrapers even. The fountain in the middle is a large-scale sculpture, modern, a giant head seemingly made of mirrors with water sprouting from the mouth. It reminded me of the metamorphosis of David Cerny down in North Carolina. The mansion, the mansion is up to the right. You expect an old opulent masterpiece, but the panes had gone with something white and cup cubist. Still, despite the modern, it, modern of it, I can see climbing vines and ivy along the side. To the left it w is what appears to be a golf course. I can only see two holes, but this is private grounds along the prime real estate of Easton Bay. So how many holes would make sense? There are two waterfalls and what looks like an infinity pool blended into the ocean. There is no one outside. It is silent other than distant echoes of the crashing waves. So what now? Our plan, which we admit is piss poor, is for me to skulk around the property and see whether I can spot anything really. Ideally, Matthew, I know, I know, but what other plan is there? Rachel is going to talk to Hayden, confront him even, and if none of that works, work, if we couldn't find Matthew or any clues, I still have the gun. I feel oddly safe. I assume, of course, that pretty funny Irene has called the police. At some point, they will find traffic cameras or whatever and maybe be able to trace us into Newport. But we still have time, or at least I think that we do. I make my way up the drive, sticking close to the evergreens. When I'm close enough to see the front door, I duck down and watch. Rachel heads for the door. I'm probably 50 or 60 yards away. The state, no surprise, is massive. When Rachel approaches the front door, it opens. Hayden Payne steps out. That's the end of chapter 36. What y'all think about to happen? We won't know so until we read the next two chapters. Bye.